Professor Annie Timani, Acting Executive Dean, Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Habib Nurbai, inductee, Professor Tim Noakes, Emeritus Professor of Sports Science and Chief Medical, the family who have joined us, Iqbal Nurbai, the father, Koresha Majid, the mom, Dr. Aslam Nurbai, brother Zia Nurbai, niece, Katya Halabi, and I must again acknowledge that you're here especially for this from overseas, so thank you for that. Um, Professor Abdel Hal Halbi, Karima Halbi, and Zara Halbi, and thank you very much for, for joining us, distinguished guests. And to those of you who have joined us through Facebook and YouTube, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and students, Sani Bonani, Khoyanand, Good evening, Chabela. It is indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to this professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Nurbai. As I do so, I wish to express a warm welcome once again to his loved ones, special guests, and colleagues. This is indeed a proud and joyful, yet a landmark moment for all of you, for Professor Nurbai, for us here at the University of Johannesburg, higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office by the vice chancellor and deliver their inaugural addresses. I serve here on the vice chancellor's behalf. This, this ceremony has its roots in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it is an expression of welcome and an entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. In Isiktosa, we say, ukuteswa isidanga Kwisigaba Sobojingwa Luazi. This loosely translated refers to assuming the role of the professor. Of course, in colonial traditions subscribed to by many universities, this refers to the gown and the cap. Traditionally, the wise one would accept a blanket in Gubo. Once we have listened to the inaugural address, the gown or in Gubo denoting the professorship will be formally assumed. We gather to bear witness to the entry of Professor Nurbai to the illustrious community of scholars at the university. It is a celebration of the contributions to the discipline and ultimately the impact on society. Professors provide a university with its identity, character, academic legitimacy, and integrity. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of the person as a professor. This evening, we will listen to Professor Nurbai as the gown goes to town. By this, I mean that the power of the inaugural address is when the expertise is showcased beyond the corridors of the university and reverberates with society. It stands out as a moment of pride for the incumbent, the family, fellow scholars, the university, and ultimately society. For the German philosopher and diplomat, Humboldt, said a university referred to, the, referred to as the whole community of scholars and students engaged in the common search for truth. Newman talked about teaching universal knowledge. Recently, universities have been viewed as instrumental, instrumentalists serving the purpose of the economy or utilitarian in purpose. I would hope that we can break out of these narrow conceptualizations and reflect on the university as contributing to public good. Edward Said, in an article on defiance and taking positions, offers a formulation of the ideal role of the true intellectual as one who commands a vast knowledge of the individual's discipline, who is rigorous in the analysis of literature, who views being an intellectual as a vocation, the intellectual who considers it necessary to step into the public sphere 
and to speak truth to power, namely to question, interpret, and understand authority rather than consolidating it, to step out of the boundaries of the academy, to connect oneself, to affiliate oneself, to align oneself with an ongoing process or contest of some sort, perhaps with the aim of improving the lot of the oppressed, the intellectual who functions as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections that are otherwise hidden and to provide alternatives for mistaken policies. It remains then for us as a university with a pan-African vision to derive our mandate as intellectuals and as professors. How do we embrace the role of a professor as a disruptor while continuing to be flagship carriers, ca carriers of our disciplines? This evening, as we listen to Professor Nurbai, as one further step in the journey of being a professor, this is a journey which does, does not culminate once this lecture has been given. It is a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor with the promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in this discipline. Let me now invite the acting executive dean, Professor Annie Timane, to introduce Professor Nurbai. I thank you, Riale Bocha, Ngia Bonga, Bayadanki. Good evening. Professor Nurbai is a professor in health and sports science at the University of Johannesburg here at home. He completed his BA in sports psychology at UJ in honors in biokinetics at the University of Kosovo Natal and both MPhil in biokinetics and a PhD in exercise science at the University of Cape Town. Prof Nurbai is a registered biokinetist with the Health Professions Council of South Africa. Prior to being a permanent academic, he held a number of student leadership roles. He was a chairperson of the Muslim Students Association at UJ, where he was awarded best chairperson of a student society. He then served as a sub warden at UCT's OBZ Square residence. During this time, he significantly contributed to forming the Residence Academic Development Committee at UCT, and is still known today as RADC. For his contributions in student development, he was nominated for the Student Vice Chancellor's Award at UCT in 2014. In 2015, he was among Mail and Guardian's top 200 young South Africans. Later in 2017, he won the coveted title of Mr. South Africa and used the platform to spearhead activities within the sport, health, and education spheres. He was later inducted as a Golden Key International Honorary Member at UCT in 2018 for his contributions to academia, leadership, and service. Prof. Nurbai has worked at several universities, including the University of Cape Town, the Cape Town Peninsula University of Technology, and now at the University of Johannesburg. He has worked across all academic ranks, from lecturer to senior lecturer to associate professor and currently as a professor. He is currently the co-director of the Biomedical Engineering Healthcare Technology Research Center, which he founded at UJ in 2020. In 2021, Prof. Nubai was, was awarded the Distinguished Vice Chancellor Award for Teacher Excellence at UJ. His teaching philosophy is grounded on the basis that, I quote, lecture halls don't need tech geeks who can teach. We need teaching geeks who can use tech effectively to promote critical thinking and active, le active learning, close quote. He has also, you can see here that it's him who's speaking here. He has also supervised several students at honors, master's, PhD, and postdoctoral levels. He's currently a National Research Foundation rated researcher and continues to conduct research within two broad areas, areas, cricket sciences, as well as health education and innovation. His research aims to garner insights into science of sports, health, promotion, health, education, and innovation. Prof. Nurbai has produced more than 50 publications in peer-reviewed journals with over 50,000 reads on ResearchGate and presented his work at national and international conferences. He's a very active young man. He's an associate editor of the BMG Open, and Open Sport and Exercise Medicine Journal and has served as a reviewer for the Journal of Sports Sciences 
this African Journal of Sports Medicine, Frontiers BMC Journal, PLOS1, among others. From an innovation perspective, his work has, has resulted in several innovations, such as a coaching cricket bat to enhance the performance and bat lift of junior cricket batters, a smartphone mobile application to assist cricket coaches and players in analyzing the cricket batters' betting technique, and a teaching tool in the form of a 3D game for biokinetics, which includes both web-based and visual reality interfaces. In terms of community engagement service, Prof. Nurbai has worked with numerous sporting teams, most of which has been cricket teams, such as South Australia, Yorkshire County, Afghanistan under 19, and local provincial teams. He has also conducted a number of talks and workshops in industries such as Standard Bank, Woolworths, Cancer, PSG, Smolin, TEDx, Forbes, Health, BioAfrica, among others. He has also contributed science communication pieces at op-eds in the conversation, Mail and Guardian, The Star, The Cape Text, The Cape Times, he has been featured as a guest expert on BRS TV programs, including SABC3 Expresso, Morning Live, ENCA News, Newsroom Africa, CGTN, ITV, as well as on radio such as Radio 72, Cape Talk, SAFM, Heart FM, Radio 2000, East Coast Radio, Smile FM, and Health and Sportcast. Through his career, he has served on several department, departmental and, and faculty institutional committees. And this this includes the, faca the, faca the research committee, faculty te teaching, faculty recognized prior learning committee, faculty research ethics committee, the faculty management committee, faculty NRF postgraduate committee, UJ's digital transformation committee, UJ's 2035 strategic plan team, institutional NRF, and has also conducted for the NRF. Prof. Nurbai remains committed to making a positive difference through a combination of research teaching consultancy, advisory, leadership, science, communication, and community engagement. He continues to live by the following motto, I open quote, the ink of a scholar and the heart of a humanitarian is mightier than the blood of a martyr. Baya Danki, Geleboha, Geabonga, and thank you. Well, good evening, and thank you very much to everyone for being here. Uh, good evening, Khuyanand, Sani Bonani, Namaste, Salam, Shalom, and what's happening? Um, thank you so much for, for everyone for being here. It's really appreciated. Uh, to our DVC for Research and Internationalization, Professor Sarab Sana, Professor Eni Tamani, Acting Executive Dean, Professor Craig Vincent Lambert, Vice Dean for Teaching and Learning, and our distinguished guest and respondent for today, Professor Tim Noakes, who has come all the way from Cape Town. Thank you very much for being here. And to everyone, to all family, friends, and colleagues who are watching online, thank you very much for tuning in. So it gives me great pleasure to, to start this talk today, uh, which is the first among many of the talks that I've done in a fasted state. And I'm really hoping that it's gonna be, that it's gonna go well. And my journey uh, goes back to the game of cricket. Since a young boy, I wanted to play cricket at a very prof at a high and professional level. And unfortunately, in 2006, that was no longer possible when I sustained a lower back injury, uh, which was a stress fracture in the L5 and L4 vertebra, which is also known as a pars articularis uh, injury. And it was through that, going through that particular rehabilitation journey that I developed my love for biokinetics and sports science and therefore entered into the career of sports science. And so it's, it's really fulfilling to be here in this very chambers to speak to everyone today because when I was part of the student leadership at UJ, we had actually a meeting here and that was the last time I actually spoke in this very venue. And um, as you can see on this map, that's UJ APK building. And uh, we live in the south here in Homestead Park. And in the first two years of my university, for most days, I would walk to university about three days a week. And that walk was about 42 minutes. And thereafter, on some days, I would want to teach uh, young boys how to do cricket. And so cricket coaching took place at the Parkview Senior School in Parkview. And that took 67 minutes. And so when it came to July, in terms of Mandela Day, I had many days for those uh, that I had done. But it was through this particular journey that I got to understand the fascinating uh, field of sports science and, and, the, and the threshold of human performance, that you only set your own 
limits and threshold irrespective of what you want to achieve. And it was there that I decided to go, go further and understand the science um, of sport, but is especially the science of cricket batting. So I want to give more of an indication around the topic of my talk today. What you see on your screen is a cricket pitch. And when a batter comes on to play, they are facing a number of deliveries. And this particular white strip that you see here on the cricket pitch, that is known as the corridor of uncertainty. And so a bowler will be bowling different deliveries on the corridor of uncertainty. And the reason why it's called the corridor of uncertainty is because, especially in the format of test cricket, a batter is uncertain of whether to play the ball or to leave the ball. But if a ball is delivered just outside the corridor of uncertainty, it gives them more confidence or certainty to play the ball. So as, as with that particular delivery, it could be a cover drive. Okay, so we have these deliveries on the corridor of uncertainty, but a delivery that's just outside of the corridor on a full length delivery could be played as a cover drive. And hence the topic of my talk, which I'll get to in a second. So as in cricket as in life, as in cricket as in science, we have research questions that we are uncertain about, and we have research questions or answers that we are certain about. And in science, we're always navigating between certainty or uncertainty. And so the topic of my talk today is from the corridor of uncertainty to cover drives for impact through a sport, health, and AI lens. And, I'm, and the talk is into two main areas in cricket science and the latter part being health education and innovation. So I've always been interested in how cricket batters have evolved over time. I've always been interested in the anthropological way of how batters have evolved. And so if we look at cricket batting, there's a number of kinetic and kinematic um, aspects that we need to consider. And we know that cricket batting for now, in terms of success for both male and cricket batters, it, it is completely multifactorial and multidisciplinary, where it has a number of fields and disciplines that contribute to the excellence of a cricket batter. And for the purpose of the first segment of my talk is going to be around the backlift, which has a number of implications for a number of these disciplines that, we, that you see on your screen. And so part of the work that we've done on the backlift has included work around 400 cricket players and 160 cr cricket coaches. And I'm now going to try and summarize that for you in a few minutes. And so it all started when I had to read a century of sources, which comprised of 47 books, 37 articles, and 16 DVDs. And from those particular sources, I came across quite a few notable sources, which was the MCC Cricket Coaching Manual, which basically talks about various ways in which a cricket player should bat and also other notable cricket coaching manuals that came out from 1954 right up to 2009. And they advocate of a way that a cricket batter should bat with, its re with regards to their batting technique. And we were particularly interested in the direction of the backlifting cricket. And so we later published the first study in the Journal of Sports Sciences and we wanted to understand does the practice of elite cricketers follow the theory that has been advocated in all these cricket coaching manuals over the last um, 50 to 70 years. And we were able to distinguish between two different types of backlifts, the straight backlift and the lateral backlift. And we had looked at cricket players um, over the last century and we found that there's also a distinction between batters having a closed face of the bat or an open face of the bat as exhibited by Sir Donald Bradman. And so to speak about Sir Donald Bradman, this is a graph of the highest test averages uh, over the last hundred years. These are the 30 players that have the highest test averages over the last hundred years. And from those 30 players in the last hundred years, five of those players, as you can see on screen, had a straight backlift. And this is for test cricket. But at the very top, we have an elephant in the room, and that's Sir Donald Bradman. And we can see that he has a big difference of 38 to 40 runs of a gap between himself and between the batters that are, that are down on, on the graph, which means that every time that he went out to bat, he scored 40 runs more than any other cricket player in the history of cricket. And for test cricket, that's significant. And so we were really interested to understand, well, if, if he can do that in test cricket, obviously with n a number of factors that are changing in modern day cricket, which we can't really extrapolate uh, compared to his time, certainly there was something behind his success. And so if that was being administered by him, we needed to understand, well, what was happening with his peers from that time? 
And so we want to understand from 1895 for 2014, what were other cricket batters doing in terms of their backlift? And so you can see that a number of these pictures are not very well pixelated. They're quite old. And so we had to do quite a number of 2D analysis with various other forms of modeling to really understand whether the backlift was straight or lateral. But as we moved on, we began to understand that a vast majority of these successful cricket batters did not exhibit a straight backlift. They actually exhibited a lateral backlift. And then we start to find that even at the IPL uh, level, if you go on now and, and watch the IPL, which is happening right now, you'll find that a vast majority, if not all of the batters, have a lateral backlift. And one of the key questions that a lot of people ask, and they say, why are you doing research in cricket? And my answer to them is that T20 cricket specifically is growing in popularity. After the sporting codes of football, Formula One and Olympics, T20 cricket today is the fourth most watched sport around the globe. The IPL right now has informed us that it's probably going to reach almost a billion viewership. And so the implications that we have for education, awareness, health implications for the youth are vast through the sport of cricket. And very recently, we also now see that Major League Cricket has recently been approved by the International Cricket Council. So if that was what's happening at the elite level, well, we want to understand what's happening at the provincial or the franchise level. And so what I wanted to do was to analyze the South African professional cricketers around the country. And I spoke to a number of coaches and I said, look, I want to analyze your cricketers within a 30 day period. And they told me that wouldn't be possible. And so I interpreted the, the, what they said as impossible as probable. And so off I went. And I drove around the country about 8,500 kilometers, and I tested all these teams, which comprise of about 118 professional cricket players, 25 county professional cricketers in the UK, and then we looked at existing footage of the South African Proteas cricket team. And there were three variables that we were interested in, the backlift, the, their stance, and the scoring areas around the cricket field. And we recently, pub well, we published this paper in 2019 in the South African Journal of Sports Medicine, and we found that there was a trend with particular formats in cricket. In test cricket, it's around 75%. It grows by 5% at ODI level and then a further 10% at T20 cricket. So we can see that as we, we can see that the lateral backlift becomes a lot more common on the more shorter version of the game. And there was a significant difference between these different formats. So it was, the study found that a lateral backlift is more common at the highest levels of cricket batting. A lateral backlift has been shown to positively affect the stance and footwork of batters, whereby most batters with a lateral backlift also have an open stance. And the study also demonstrated that batters who have a lateral backlift were more likely able to score runs in various areas around the cricket field on their wagon wheel instead of just a few areas. So if that's what's happening with the different formats, well, what's happening with the different levels of cricket? And here what we found from the adolescent levels going right up to the international levels, that the prevalence of the lateral backlift is lower at 25%. It increases to the amateur level at 38%, very similar at 40% at the state county level, and then increases dramatically as you get to the international level. And so when we look at cricket batting, we begin to understand that it's not a sports motion that happens in a linear plane. It's a counter-linear motion that exhibits rotational angular momentum. And when we compare that, it's very similar to other sports, uh, sporting codes, such as javelin, the forehand in tennis, um, a baseball hit, and as well as a rotational power ball throw uh, against the wall, like we see in CrossFit. And so that's what we see, is that a lot of these elements are very similar if you want to generate power, precision, and accuracy, especially in the shorter format of, of the game. And then we did a four-way comparison of the backlift among different levels, and we found that among coach cricketers, in this particular example, an amateur cricketer and an adolescent cricketer, we see that their backlift is very straight, straight back towards the keeper above the stumps. But if we take an uncoached cricketer, a cricketer that has never been coached, it is not a natural movement for them to pick up their bat straight over the stumps or towards the keeper which indirectly suggests that traditional coaching methods that have come out from 1954, if they are exposed to these traditional coaching methodologies, then they would not lift their bat up in a lateral way because it's simply not a natural movement to lift your bat up straight over the wicket or towards the wicket keeper. And so we want to understand, well, if that was happening at those various levels, and if cricket coaches informed us that it was quite challenging at the time when we did the study, that it was quite challenging to actually coach cricket batters on a lateral backlift, then 
can they be a tool that can assist junior cricket batters to enhance their backlift and performance? And so the idea was to merge a tennis racket and cricket bat into one. And so the first prototype of a coaching cricket bat came out. And we did a study, an, a, an intervention study over six weeks, where the one group used a normal cricket bat in training. And a coaching cricket bat uh, in training was done by the other group. And this paper was published in the BMJ <coughs> Open Journal. And we found that over a six-week intervention period, the control group had a similar amount of runs, uh, of runs from week one to week six. But in the, in the experimental group, when they used the coaching bat, their runs uh, almost doubled. So we can't have this evidence as conclusive because this was on one population group. And of course, the research in this area is further ongoing. But the pro uh, and, and, and this particular study had an effect size of 5.41. And the Lord's Cricket Museum showed an interest in this particular bat. And right now, it's been, it, if you go to the Lord's Cricket Museum today, you will find this coaching cricket bat in their special collections of, of different cricket bats. And that was in 2016 with our collaborator, Russell Hummer, who is the son of the late Bob Hummer, who really inspired us towards this fascinating project. And now in 2023, we have come into a more developed prototype and we are hoping that we can advance research within this area of, this, of the coaching cricket bat. And hopefully in future, a lot more players will be able to, to use it and benefit uh, moving forward. So aside from the backlift, um, how do we really incorporate technology and innovation in readily understanding and analyzing the batting techniques in cricket? And so we did a study in 2022 with my collaborators, Tevin Moodley and Professor Dustin van der Haar, and we published this paper in a Nature Portfolio Journal in Scientific Reports, where the, the cricket backlift could be automatically recognized using deep learning architectures. So we integrated the use of computer science with sports science to really understand if automati automated recognition can be done in sports analytics. And the short uh, answer to that question is that yes, it can. But specifically, we looked at various forms of deep learning architectures, and we want to determine whether they can automatically detect the backlift between a lateral or a straight class. And what we found for the essence of time was that the exception architecture had a 98.2% accuracy prediction, thereby demonstrating its capability in differentiating between the lateral and the straight backlifts. And we know now that in the current field of machine learning and AI, there's been a vast amount of research that's been conducted, not just within cricket, but within other sporting codes that would allow us to understand in real time how to really analyze a player and how we could provide measures in place to optimize their performance or even prevent injuries. And so that's a snapshot of the exception architecture in which um, validity and reliability was applied multiple times using a, log a logistic regression formula. And so I continue to be interested and piqued by what are the determinants and factors that contribute to successful cricket batting. And one of the papers that I'm doing now is I'm working on a meta-analysis and systematic review where I want to collate all the evidence over a 30-year period, and that's because a lot of the kinetic and kinematical areas of investigation had only really started around 30 to 40 years ago. And my job now is to look at, to read all of these papers and to understand, well, what are the key determinants and factors that contribute to cricket batting success? The papers that you see on your screen are only about 40 papers, but they are almost 100 papers that we have to really study and analyze. And I think from this particular study, we will be in a better position to see what are the definitive kinetic and kinematic features, as well as other alternative determinants that contribute to a cricket batter's success, especially in modern day cricket batting. So aside from the performance aspects, the other aspect that I was really interested in is if a cricket player attends a boys only school, is it an in incidental or strategic contributing factor to South African cricket development and success? And what I had to do was I had to go through all of these pro tier cricket players that had played for South Africa since readmission in 1992 till 2019 and determine which school did they attend. And so 461 cricket players from 1992 till now, we needed to analyze it and we needed to understand whether they went to a boys' school, what type of school did they attend. And our findings showed that a vast majority of them had attended a boys' only school, and that was a key contributing factor to playing men's cricket at the highest level in South Africa. However, there were no significant differences in terms of the different cricket match formats. 
and that boys-only schools was found to be key. So aside from race, class, socioeconomic and cultural factors, and not necessarily whether they are private or public grade schools, and individual player variations as well as other factors such as the number of pupils enrolled in schools, availability of cricket facilities, coaching standards, education, a number of other support systems, also need to be considered in the study. And so this particular publication caught the attention of the media and we published an op-ed in the conversation and they want to really understand whether elite boys schools still shape South African, still shapes the South African national cricket team. And the answer is they do. We have a complete disproportionate of players that represent South Africa till this day. We have vast majority of them still went to boys only schools. And we find that to be a key factor in sporting success. And then News of Africa took it a bit further and they want to now understand, well, what is, what is the consensus around transformation in cricket? And so what I had explained to them is that what we do have right now in the sport of cricket is that we have selection and quota selections that happen at the top. And we're hoping that it's going to inspire a lot of the players at the bottom. And I'm here to tell you that that model is wrong. Because the model for to adequately transform cricket starts at the bottom and it works its way up to the top. And if we want to adequately transform sport within South Africa, we have to start at the grassroots level. Rugby has got it right, and that's because there are context, contextual factors there that are very different to the sport of cricket. But if we are able to apply transformation using this particular method of rather looking at measures that can be identified at the junior level and not interfering with selections at the top, then we will be going in the, in the right direction. And so this recent publication was with my PhD collaborator, Dr. Solomon M. Tombeni, who has conducted a brilliant PhD. His PhD is a definition of brilliance because what he did is he went to identify what are the supporting systems that have enabled previous, previously disadvantaged athletes who went to, on to represent South Africa at the Olympics. And this paper was just published this month in the South African Journal of Sports, uh, of Sports Medicine, where he showed factors promoting and hindering sporting success among South African former Olympians from historically disadvantaged areas. And the, he had identified nine broad themes which contributes to various support systems that exist within sport and within Olympics. And so the message from this is that more research needs to be conducted around, among various sporting codes and not just within the Olympic context to really under understand how can we provide enabling support systems to our athletes from previously disadvantaged areas? There's, um, there's an exponential amount of talent in South Africa, and we really need to invest and tap our time and energy into that. And that begs the question moving forward, well, what does the future of sport performance look like? So what I'm now going to do in my talk is try to give you a bridge between cricket and health, and that is the future of sport performance. And so what you see here on screen is a race by Usain Bolt where he ran the race in 9.58 seconds. And what you're going to hear right now on your screen are two sounds. You are going to hear the sound and I want you to think what you think that is. So I'm not sure if they are able to hear that sound. But there's two sounds that happen very quickly and and the, the, there are two sounds that happen very quickly and the difference between those two sounds is not the difference between the first place and the last place player, the last place runner. It's the difference between, it's not the difference between the first place and the second place person, sorry. It's the difference between the first place and the last place runner. And when we look at running of 100 meters or 200 meters, it's not measured in seconds, it's measured in split seconds. So if this particular guy is 0.001 seconds slower, that's the difference between a gold and a silver medal. And if this guy is getting a bronze medal and he is uh, third place instead of second place, he is 0.003 seconds slower. And so these athletes are competing over a four-year period for the Olympics or the Paralympics, not to compete for a second advantage, but to compete for a split second advantage. And it's making the sporting landscape even more competitive, right? I'll give you another example. This graph took a long time. And what I did is I computed a graph of data of the world progression record of the men's 100 meters from 1920 till right now. And so what you see on your screen are the actual values. And then we have predicted values of where we had expected the record of 9.58 seconds in the 100 meter. 
And what we see is that the turning point happened just after 2000. Something happened. There's a reason why we got a bit faster, because the predictive model shows that we would only been able to reach 9.58 seconds about 20 years later, which shows that Usain Bolt is a runner is 20 years ahead of his time. But if we look at the first race that was in 1920, that was 10.6 seconds, and we look at the current record, which is 9.58 seconds, what does that tell us after a 100-year period? For females, it took 100 years for females to get three seconds faster. That was ran in 1920 at 13.6, and this particular time is the record by Elaine Thompson at 10.54. But for the men, over 100 years, they have only been one second faster. It took them 100 years to get a second faster, which means how do you comprehend or define sports performance when it's measured in split seconds? And so to give you another example, here what we have is a 800 meter freestyle world record progression time course for both men and women. And there's their times from 1900 odd till right now. And if we put a line of best fit, we can see that their times have improved over time. And so what is the message from the slide when we look at the future of sport performance in that records are meant to be broken. We're gonna continue seeing records being broken in every sporting code. And athletes today that continue to perform at a high level are a few decades ahead of their time. But why? Why are they ahead of their time? I think a lot of us would speculate that it's probably doping or it's innovation or technology that have enabled them or it's other factors that have contributed. But there's a simple explanation compared to the 1900s till now. And that is what we have now is a far bigger pool of athletes that are participating in sport, not just elite sport, just mass sport participation. And a number of these athletes who are in this pool of mass sport participation, they want to become elite athletes. And so what we have currently in the sports performance context is that we have a funnel. And all of these players are entered into this funnel. And along this funnel, they realize that there's a spectrum of mass sport participation to talent pathways of how do we provide talent mapping and talent identification. But from this funnel, what we can see is that only a few athletes come out of, the, of this funnel from hundreds and thousands of athletes that want to play at a higher level, which makes the system a lot more competitive, which is a good thing for sport, but it's also a tough thing for an aspiring child who wants to play sport for their country. And right now we have a consensus where sport as a whole has become increasingly competitive to previous decades. And so right now we are on a continuum. On the one hand, we're trying to enhance sport performance, and, but on the other hand, we also need to be mindful of how do we prevent injury. And the elephant in the room that's also now that has been propagated by COVID is mental health. There's an increased prevalence around mental health among athletes. So a particular example, uh, that, that a study that we did with my master's collaborator by Lucejo Malele, for his master's study, he looked at mental health profiles among semi-professional cricket players, which was recently accepted in the South African Journal of Sports Medicine. And he found that there were moderate levels of stress, anxiety, and depression among semi-professional cricketers. And he also looked at the data and found that there were also moderate relationships between um, mental health symptoms and the way cricket players perform. So if their mental health systems are up, potentially their performance could go down. We do not really understand what the basis is among other sporting codes, and so further research is required in this area. But we do have other research that has been conducted in cricket at various levels. But what this does is that it, it, it paints a spotlight for mental health in sport. That it's not only sport performance and injury prevention right now. We have a third important arm, and that's mental health. And so these three areas contribute to an important question. And that question is, how can technology and innovation better optimize sport performance as well as reduce injuries and mental health systems? Well, currently right now, we are in the field of artificial intelligence. And so how can we use AI? How can we integrate AI to really focus on those particular questions? And so recently I drafted an op-ed in the Manning Guardian where I tried to demonstrate that at this point in time, AI cannot replace human expertise. And I explained this through various six E's where AI is not there to replace us, but what it does is that it offers us enablement and extension, empowerment and enhancement, education, and there's also uh, quite a number of things that we have to look at from an ethical perspective. Over time, we will probably see that AI is gonna become a lot more sophisticated and smarter. We're seeing the rise of GPTs. We're seeing ChatGPT4, 
that's also now on the rise. And we know that AI is going to be a lot smarter as we go on. But for the hard sciences, when it comes to particular soft skills that have to be applied, there are certain elements that AI cannot replace, but there are certain things that AI can replace. And that's something that we have to decipher. But why am I telling you this? I'm going to use a story of what had happened, uh, which was a few years ago. This is a, life, a, a true life story that had happened many years ago. And it was communicated through, uh, through a movie uh, called Sully, which was played by lead actor Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks plays the lead um, a pilot in the airplane, and he's with his co-pilot as well. And what had happened was that the airplane had landed in the Hudson River. Now, let me backtrack uh, for a bit. What happened was that there was a bird strike, and a bird strike had gone into one of the engines, and the plane completely seized. It lost all control of the aircraft, where the, air, where the, the pilot could not control the, air, the, the aircraft any longer. And so they looked at whether they could turn the airplane and land on one of the landing strips nearby, but realized that they would be on a lower terrain and they would have crashed into one of the buildings. And so he took a brave decision and instead of going back to the, one of the landing strips in Manhattan, he landed the aircraft in the Hudson River. There were no casualties, there were minor injuries, but till today, the passengers are alive, and he is alive. But obviously, because this was a stunt that was unconventional, you see, and so people were questioning why he did it. And so there was a commission of inquiry that was held by the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board in Manhattan, in America, and they wanted to find out what had happened. And I'm going to give you the long to short version, and that is when they did the commission of inquiry, they asked all of the other skilled pilots to run through computer simulations whether the airplane could have turned back and landed into one of those airstrips. And they said that they could, that the simulations dictated that they were able to turn back and land on one of the airstrips. And then Sally came out and said, well, did you account for the human factor? Because they were told immediately once the bird has hit the, air, the engine, they were told to turn back and land on one of the airstrips. In real pressure, in the real environment, in real life, they had to take a calculated guess and calculation on what to do, which took about five to 10 seconds. And those five to 10 seconds could be all the difference in the world. And because of that, they realized that they wouldn't be able to make it. And so when they accounted for that time and expert and the human expert error, they re-ran the computer simulations and they found out that had they waited five seconds later, the airplane would have crashed into one of the buildings. And so what do we learn from this? If, if, if aviation was a sport, he'd be a national sporting hero. But what do we learn from this particular story is that there's two theories that emanate from the story. And the first theory is, is the expertise theory and metacognition. And so expertise theory talks to, it demonstrates how skill and talent develops and emerges over time, practice and repetition through experiential learning, strategy, knowledge, and application. It documents how individuals become experts in their domain or field through a process of cognitive task analysis and portrays the necessary skills and expertise more robustly, effectively, and efficiently than novices. And leading on to this particular theory around the expertise theory is another theory which I'd like to explain. I did my undergraduate degree at, at UJ in sports psychology, and we were taught concepts of self-regulation among athletes. We were taught self-awareness, self-reflection, self-belief, visualization, imagery, among other important sports psychological concepts that are important for athlete success. What no one really tells us is how do each of these parameters together contribute as one systemic theory that can enhance sport or any particular skill or theory in any sector. And that is known as metacognition. And Sully exhibited traits of ex the expertise theory and metacognition. He practiced self-regulation, self-awareness, self-reflection, and self-belief. He had the belief of himself and his team to land the plane in the Hudson River. And we now see this being perfectly exhibited among other sporting heroes, among other sporting teams and athletes who have done fantastic things in the world of sport. And this is also communicated very well through the book of Richard Sutton in his book called Thrive, The Power of Resilience, where he also speaks about metacognition and how people can really look into enhancing or delivering their human potential. And so before I move on to the next part, and I'm not very good on time, but we have this quadrant which we're very familiar on where there's a quadrant where you're either in here. I know what I know. There are things we are aware of and understand. I know what I don't know. There are things we are aware of but don't understand. 
I don't know what I know. There are things we understand but are not aware of. And then I don't know what I don't know. Things we are neither aware of nor understand. So where do we as people or where do we as athletes fit in with this particular quadrant within our particular research area, within our line of work, within our day-to-day -day activities? What are we aware of? What do we understand and what do we know? And so that uh, brings me, uh, that bridges to the next part of the talk and that's health education and innovation. And right now in the health sciences curriculum, I'm now going to be talking about some innovations within the health sciences context in that we have a number of exciting enablers in terms of innovations in technologies. We've got virtual reality, augmented reality, digital health, gamification, extended realities, 3D printing, robotics, the internet of medical things, electronic health records and distributed ledger technologies, which are all really exciting. And one of the things that we had done right now is we had piloted um, a game and uh, for four biokinetic students. And this was born out of the challenges that we had gone through with biokinetics. Unfortunately, a number of our third and fourth year students during lockdown were not able to go to the lab. And so they were a bit back in terms of skills and clinical reasoning skills. And so when I read up on the literature during lockdown, I found something which was known as simulated based learning, SBL. And one of the forms of SBL was gamification. And so I wanted to see whether we could integrate gamification for biokinetics. And what you see on screen is the web-based version of the various scenarios that third-year third year biokinetic students would be able to do on their computer. And so various forms of scenarios ranging from stress ECG to spirometry to isokinetics for the ankle, the knee and the shoulder, the biodex balance, which is critical for patients with stroke or neurological conditions, um, and then as well as OSCEs, orthopedic structured and clinical, clinical examinations. And um, a lot of thanks must go to our collaborators, Simone Ferreira and Yakin Sadik for their work on this project, because now we have been able to migrate that particular project um, onto the Oculus Quest 2 on VR, on the VR headsets, where the students become the practitioner. And I want to give you a distinction between the web-based scenario they work with and the virtual reality headset. And so what you see on your screen is the same scenario, but with two different interfaces. So this is the blood test that they would do for cholesterol and glucose. And on the right, we have the Oculus Quest 2, where the patient is right in front of them. And as we move along, we can now see that this is the difference between the, uh, st uh, the, the ECG placements. On the one hand, this is a web-based game, and on the other hand, we have the VR headset that even shows it for the, for, for, for the, um, the cyclogometer test, and then we even have it for blood, blood pressure and heart rate and a number of other clinical skills tests that students can now do. So we have really advanced in the field of innovation and technology within the health sciences. And this was another paper that we had published which speaks about the particular uh, utilizations, constraints, and future possibilities of integrating mHealth and e-learning in the health sciences. And what we found from this particular paper is that there's so much more that we still need to do. And there's an iceberg model with this particular paper, because if we adopt an iceberg approach in the health sciences context when it comes to teaching, there are things that we see, know, apply, and do, but then there are things that we don't see what we don't know, what we don't apply, and what we don't do. So in the context of what we see, know, apply, and do, these are the things that we currently do. We are training students to become health practitioners and health professionals. And in the South African context, we are aware of the primary healthcare situation and the infrastructural challenges that we have. We have a disparate and a very uh, concerning issue right now when it comes to primary health care facilities in South Africa. So these are the things that we see, know, apply, and do with various skills with our students. What are the things that we don't see? Well, we are aware that GBV is prevalent, but we don't see it among our students or staff. We are aware that load shedding has become a problem, but we have not seen what students really go through. We are aware that there are financial difficulties among students, but we don't see what they're going through. And so there's a bit of a paradox in terms of how do we embrace the student using various forms of technological means. What we don't know, we are aware that digital literacy skills are important at all levels of education, but we don't know which particular students have what, what the capabilities are in terms of digital literacy. We are aware that skills are important in the context of health sciences. What we don't know is transferable skills. How can they take current skills 
uh, uh, collaborate it with digital literacy skills and transfer it in the context of the practice or the field that they work in. We are aware that mental health is a problem, but we do not know with which particular students and staff that are currently suffering it. And then what we don't apply. We are aware as well that M health is important, it's on the rise, but we do not sufficiently apply M health in the context of our teaching. We are aware that remote proctoring systems are needed, AI integrated forms of, in, of academic integrity that are needed for assessments, teaching and learning, but we do not sufficiently apply it at this, in this point in time. We are also aware that if we could integrate OSCEs online via mixed uh, realities, it would really enhance a lot of students. The problem with this particular issue is, that, is the aspect of touch. They will not be able to feel touch or assess their patient. And so that's a challenge that we have. But what we don't know is that through mixed realities and extended realities, we can afford a number of these paradigms to enhance the understanding of health sciences students working within the space. What we are aware of is the importance of the, of the integration of digital health in the rural settings where students and interns are working within. What we don't know is how less of digital health and transformation technology that we have, but what we also don't know is so much of the good work that's been done by a number of incubators in the field where we can really partner and collaborate with to bring this to our students so that they can have an enhanced level of understanding and more so make a difference to the patients who are really in need within the rural health context. And lastly, what we don't do. Well, what we're currently not doing is having a multimodal system in the form of a tailored learning management system for health sciences. We have a number of LMSs within universities. We've got Vula, we've got Desire to Learn, we've got Blackboard, uh, we've got Sakai, we've got various forms of LMSs. What we don't have is a particular tailored learning management system for health sciences students, where for both students and teachers, it will be effective for them. If they want to track their student intern or professional registration with the HPCSA, the dashboard of the LMS could be that bridging between the, um, the delays that we're currently experiencing and, and a number of other features and elements and integrations that we could also bring um, and also partner with other forms of LMSs to bring a tailored LMS approach. And why? Because we realize that where if you focus a lot on good health education, you're indirectly enhancing the healthcare workforce. You're helping the patient indirectly if you are teaching health professionals who are becoming health professionals. And that's why health education is so important, especially now in the context of the fourth industrial revolution. And so we're really looking forward to taking this project forward. And a lot of thanks must go to Dr. Nikki Sims and Dr. Nadia Hartman, who are working with us on this project and where we're taking this forward. And so to summarize my future research directions with some toys and projects, currently right now we have a cricket bat sensor and, and that's the size of the sensor. It's the size of a five rand coin. And what it does is that you attach it to the distal end of your cricket bat handle, and in real time, it gives you inputs of what a cricket batter is doing. And it tells you a number of features and a number of kinetic parameters and kinematic parameters that we can see not in 2D, but in 3D. And um, my master's collaborator, Amara Patel, who is now gonna be doing this uh, for her master's project, where she's now gonna look at the backlift among female cricket players within South Africa. And then another exciting project that we're looking at is the incorporation of electroencephalography, the EEG within sport and health. And we recently procured the Biosignals Plux uh, device um, in which the, the cap is fitted onto a participant and we can track the brain activity of a participant or an athlete. The, the pros of this is that we are able to detect a number of brain activities and patterns in the frontal lobe and in the parietal lobe, but there are limitations for the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe, so we can't really see much of that. Another limitation is that this particular device has, has to be measured when there's not abstract movements. So if there's too many abstract movements, then the validity of the data is not going to be very high. But what we want to try and do is see if we can incorporate EEG analysis with 3D biomechanical analysis. So this is a conventional 3D biomechanics analysis that we do, which is known as the Vicon. But can we have the EEG cap on the batter while they're performing 
certain uh, cricket movements so that we can really understand what happens with a cricket batter. Is there any correlation or relationship with their brain activity to particular kinetic parameters? Um, or maybe there isn't, but we really will need to understand what happens in the brain of any particular athlete. And there's quite a bit of research already out there. Uh, neuroscientific analysis has merged quite a bit with biomechanical analysis in sport to really understand what happens with the brain in sport, but not much has been done from a cricket batting context. And that's an area that we want to now explore. And then, of course, uh, we, we've got 10 Oculus Quest 2 VR headsets from Meta, and I want to give thanks to Dr. Hammond Mayberg for suggesting that, because this has been fascinating in our research so far. And we're re really looking forward to taking this forward as well in the sporting context, where we now can even incorporate a number of ambulation aids, such as a cricket bat handle that attaches to a VR headset controller, and we could simulate various forms of cricket activities using VR and uh, conventional forms of training and see whether VR can act as a buffer in terms of performance optimization. And very similarly in a tennis context, um, we have tennis handles that can do this as well with the controllers. And we are very excited to see what my master's collaborator, David Copping, is also now going to do with his project where he wants to now uh, integrate VR in terms of performance optimization and whether in conjunction with the FIFA 11 plus injury prevention program, can it also assist in reducing injuries among tennis players? And so the way forward is twofold. It's cricket science and health education and innovation. And that is cricket batting, the work in cricket batting will continue. Uh, neuroscientific analysis in cricket or in sport is something that I'm very excited and keen about. Uh, simulated cricket and tennis or any other sporting co uh, codes using virtual reality. And another important research question that I'm really interested in to see, is there a relationship with mathematical literacy and cricket, uh, and the sport of cricket? And so young children who, perform, who play cricket at school, do we also maybe see that there's an increase in mathematical literacy marks at school? And the reason for that hypothesis is because cricket is a unique sport where there's a number of abstract calculations to use at that, at that level. There's run rates, there's how many balls are left, how many overs are left, how many runs to get, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just one nil, two nil, three nil. And so there's a number of abstract calculations that exist in cricket. And so does it also assist players who could also be um, uh, benef uh, benefiting from mathematical literacy? And so a, collaborator, uh, a collaboration with a mathematical education expert will be really important. And then XR and AI in health education is very important. This is a very broad field and we have to start somewhere. And we're now going to start seeing that health education is only gonna take rise because of the, the most exciting involvement that exists currently within AI. Gamification in health science. And this is the seventh World Congress on Science and Medicine in Cricket, which is gonna be taking place in November this year. And this Congress uh, coincides with the World Cup every four years. And this year's taking place in November in India and really looking forward to being part of the South African faculty that's going to be there. And um, we, I just really hope that South Africa do qualify for the World Cup. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that would allow us to really understand um, how we could potentially win the next World Cup if possible. And one of the most exciting things going forward is we want to, the, our research center wants to formulate a research chair in sport and health technology. And we are really active now in trying to, for, to, to get funding to support this research chair. And a research chair is quite important. It comes from a, an era of the Islamic Caliphate where a research chair came from the name a kursi. A kursi is known as a throne or a chair. And at that time, as well as the Ottoman Empire, there were many uh, companions that would report to the chair or to the throne. And so now in academia, we have a number of research chairs that are doing amazing work. And so it would be on us to really try and see if we can promote this because one of the other things aside from sport and health technology is preventative medicine. And I gave this, TED, uh, this TEDx talk two years ago to explain how health and productivity could be enhanced using the five S's, and that would be optimizing sleep, smoking uh, cessation, eliminating sugar, reducing sedentary behavior, sitting time, and reducing stress. And so the research chair would also have a preventative medicine component, would speak to a number of sustainable development goals, and that's good health and well-being, uh, quality education, <coughs> industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, and partnerships for the goals. 
And so let's come to the very end of my presentation, and that is you remember seeing certainty versus uncertainty. And so what are the things that we could be certain and uncertain about? Well, in the cricket context, I derived a funnel plot, and what we see is that we have, um, if we have our ranges and our datum on this side, we could have more certainty, and if it's on this side, there's more uncertainty. But if you're in the middle, if you think coffee is good and bad, you've taken the role of someone in the middle, and that's consensus. Science is not about consensus. Uh, by the way, go coffee is very good for you. And so what we can see from the research that we've done is that cricket batting is multifactorial. We have certainty in that. The lateral back curve is a contributing factor to successful cricket batting. We have a higher degree of certainty in that. The lateral back curve is also a key factor for batting success among women. We're uncertain about that. We are yet to investigate that particular research area. Mental health among athletes in all sports, we are uncertain. There are various contextual factors that we need to understand with various sporting codes. Metabolic syndrome is a leading risk factor for all-cause mortality. This was high blood sugar, high blood sugar, dyslipidemia, or even a high rate of obesity, coupled with poor sleep or physical inactivity. There is sufficient evidence to show that it does contribute to all-cause mortality, which shows a very strong certainty. Eating in moderation does not work. That is a very strong certainty, and because when I was in practice, and although I would refer a lot of patients to dietitians, in my role as a biokineticist, moderation. And eating in moderation, moderation is not something that is quantifiable. When you go out here and have a plate of food, some will take a side plate and some will take a bigger plate. And that's because we eat with our eyes. And if you tell someone you eat in moderation, their interpretation or definition of moderation is very different. It's completely relative on the spectrum. And so we know that eating in moderation does not work. The focus rather is on the quality of the macronutrients that you rather consume. AI will never replace core human expertise. We have certainty around that, but we also have a range towards uncertainty because we do it's evolving at a rapid rate. And so as we go in time, unfortunately, we also may start to see a lot of jobs being replaced by AI if it's not, um, um, except for the ones that are hard science or, or hard skill driven. The South African men's cricket team are not chokers, and I have certainty in that, uh, because there's a number of factors behind why they are not chokers, because we compare each World Cup to the, all of the other World Cups, and if you look at all the World Cups from 1992 till now, you'll see that they, each one of them had pressure, but there were a number of factors that were explained, and if you speak to all the teams and to all the managers that, had, were, uh, that took part in those particular teams, they will tell you that it wasn't just a chokers label. And so we have continued giving them the chokers label. So I ask you, please, if we qualify for the World Cup, please do not label them as chokers. <laughs> and one thing we can certainly be certain about is death. And that's right on the end of the spectrum. Without any ranges, death is something we can be certain about. Barcelona better than Real Madrid, or Jennifer Lopez and Rian Krivachen do not age. I have no idea about this particular data, and that's because that's completely anecdotal. And, and the message from the slide is that we have some signs that have been brought to our attention that are completely anecdotal. This is something that we need to use in our research of whether we're certain or whether we're uncertain. If we are uncertain, we need to do more research. We need to discover more. If we have a degree of certainty, we can still even do a lot more research. And so this paints the picture around the topic of my talk, which is around the corridor of uncertainty towards providing more impact in the various areas that you are working in. And so the lessons that I've learned so far, um, unfortunately, we've noticed various forms of discrimination in the halls of the workplace in academia. And one of the things that I have personally faced is ageism. Uh, we discriminate people based on their age. If someone is elderly, we do not give them opportunities because, because they, we perceive them to have low energy, we do not renew their contract or we do not give them opportunities. And on the other side of the coin, if someone is too young, we perceive them to be inexperienced and say, well, unfortunately, due to your age, we can't uh, put you in a particular position. And so we have uh, people experiencing this on a daily basis. And it's our job as leaders of universities and organizations to try and put a stop towards ageism, among other forms of discrimination. We also have a distinct imbalance between mediocrity and meritocracy. In a number of sectors and organizations, we're finding that certain outcomes are possibly mediocre and not um, based on meritocracy. We need to start focusing a lot more 
on meritorious based activities. We are seeing an increased amount, of, uh, an increased exodus of people leaving South Africa. And it's now important that we focus on meritocracy. We've got to embrace criticism. I'm really stunned that when we are criticized by the work that we do, we take it as personal. Constru constructive criticism is something that you want. It's fuel for motivation. If you're not getting criticized, perhaps you're not doing anything right or interesting. And so you want criticism. The other important aspect now in academia is that we currently have a pandemic of academic bullying. Let's not deny that. And that's, there's an increased prevalence of academic bullying. And in star, instead of bringing people up together, we are focused on bringing people down. And my message to everyone is that let's focus on bringing people up. Everyone's journey is different. Everyone's destination is different. We can't compare. And the problem is that we compare too much. And so we really need to stop this pandemic of academic bullying. And, and that leads to the next thing. One of the critical problems that we need to work on is our relationships with people. I find that if you focus on the relationship with a particular individual, their view of your work is less subjective but more objective. And if you have an issue with a particular person, it's because of their subjective view of what they think about you personally. And so we need to be a little bit more mature about this and really understand that focusing on the relationships with people is a key aspect of advancing work of scholarship, especially as, as an academy or as a university. This, these are the kinds of things that we have to start focusing on. Generalizations versus individualistic phenomena. I think sometimes we generalize too quickly, uh, especially, for example, if we're doing an RCT trial among a small population of 10 people, we then say, well, that's what the study showed. But it's important that we look at the quality of the evidence. How do we synthesize evidence to arrive at a particular phenomena? How do we generalize and how do we provide individualistic phenomena? And so this is also something that I've learned. How are we able to balance between generalizations and particular individualistic phenomena that may not be applicable to the general population group? And lastly, I've learned as well that science is a method of inquiry and not a form of consensus. We are curious about science, we develop a hypothesis, we want to test the hypothesis, we could be right, we could be wrong, but it's important that we're truthful irrespective of whether we're truthful or right. And we remain modest and humble about what our findings is. And, that, uh, and this is common knowledge, but inter and transdisciplinary collaborations are important. I find a lot of people work in their silos. And what I'm more interested in is transdisciplinary collaborations, working with engineers, working with computer scientists, working with anthropologists, working with educators, working with mathematicians. All of those have contributed significantly to the era of sports science. And lastly, because of the, tra the trajectory that I have had, it's only important that I do give back. And so from 2024, I'll, I'll be starting a bursary fund where I will help one student who has a particular challenge with public transport, uh, but also has a passion for sports science. And I'm hoping that this bursary fund from 2024 will increase as time goes by. And lastly, Bruce Lee, I followed him from a very young child, uh, as, a, as, as a young child till now, and, he's, and his life was taken away too quickly. And he says, if you always put limits on everything you do, physical or anything else, it will spread into your work and into your life. There are no limits, there are only plateaus, and you must not stay there, you must go beyond them. And we find in sport, there is no threshold for performance. If you set a threshold, that's your threshold. There's no threshold. It's, it's, it's not finite, and that's something that we need to learn. And so I'd really like to thank a number of people along my journey. Of course, my respondent and my mentor, Professor Tim Noakes. In 2009, I came across the law of running and the art and science of cricket. And I read these books and I was absolutely astounded by the work that they have produced. And I told myself and I said, I would like to meet Prof Noakes one day. That's what I told him. I just want to meet him. And let alone, I didn't just meet him. I worked with him. I was inspired by him. I was mentored by him and I was taught by him until today we remain very good colleagues and respectable friends. And for that, I want to thank you, Prof Noakes, for everything that you've done. And then there are, there are key enablers as well within UJ, uh, within the university environment. Professor Yoga Kupu has been absolutely fantastic as a mentor and um, he's possibly quite underrated in his field and uh, he has helped many students. He has helped many people and I really want to thank him for what he has done. 
to our DVC research, Professor Sarab Sana for what you have done, Professor Siam Khan, um, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, and to Professor Ramnik as well for, for their support, and to many colleagues within the university for their support, and to Professor Craig Vincent Lambert, the Vice Dean of Teaching and Learning. Thank you very much as well for, for what you've done. And then to uh, one, a, a group of um, uh, my favorite people, my master's collaborators, and I say collaborators because they're my postgrad students, but I don't like to say my students. They're my collaborators. And once they move forward, they're gonna develop niches and careers of their own, and we're gonna become colleagues. And one of the main reasons I stay in academia is because of you, because your success is my fulfillment. And when I see that success in you, it keeps me going. So please, please keep going, because if you don't keep going, I might not be here. And then unfortunately, along our career, we have to remember the people who have passed. And unfortunately, there's a number. Uh, Sandile Sibeko, um, Audrey Winkler from UCT, Khadija Aaron from UCT, Noel Adams and, and Professor Suellen Shea. These people have been champions with, within, within my career trajectory and it's not, 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 not something that I can forget. So I really would like to thank them and I know that they're here in spirit. And then most importantly, my family. Um, my, my mom, uh, my dad, uh, I think he's gone to the loo. Um, <laughs> my, my brother, Dr. Aslam Nurbai, uh, my sister, Katija Halabi, who has come all the way from Australia with the family. Uh, to her husband, Professor Abdul Halabi, um, to his daughters, Karima and Zahra, and then to my brother's daughter, Zia, as well. Thank you very much for everything, and to my family online who are watching, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Thank you so much for everything that you've done, and to my colleagues who are here in person. It really means a lot that you've come, uh, the friends, uh, colleagues, and everyone that's here. Um, oops, I see Benita is here as well. Thank you so much for being here, and for everyone who has come. Uh, thank you so much, and I am because you are. And in the spirit of Ubuntu, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and for your attention, and I apologize for going over the time limit. Thank you. Sure. Well, Vice, Mr. Vice Chancellor, Professor Sina, Professor Tamani, and uh, obviously our professor, our new professor, honoured guests, especially Professor Habib's family. It's lovely to see all of you here today, ladies and gentlemen. That is one of the best lectures I've ever heard in sports science in 40 years in the field. And I should just sit down and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to try and do anything today. But the only reason I'm actually going to give you a lecture today or give you a speech is because I want to prove to you I'm 40 years older and I could not have given that lecture. I could not have given that lecture today. I couldn't have given it 40 years ago when I was at Habib's age. So we're dealing with someone who's really very special not just in South Africa, but globally. And I don't say that lightly. And I don't want people to say Noakes has just lost it again. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely mean it. And it comes from an observation of what I've seen in the sports science. You know, I don't want to say he's a genius. Because that labels you and it becomes a problem and you have to stick with it. But for a 34-year-old to produce that lecture is astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing. And I just want everyone to understand that, that this, we've been incredibly privileged tonight. And the University of Johannesburg is incredibly privileged to have this man. Harvard and Yale should be fighting for him now. They should be giving him an offer and you must make sure they don't take him away from us. So, you know, it's wonderful to see a South African do such a, a lecture. It just makes my heart so warm. So I thought, well, you know, what can I say? 
What more can I say? And the only thing I can say is what I've actually prepared, which was to tell you more about this man as I see him. And I think that's what's missing still, because you heard the lecture. For me to go through his lecture and tell you what he said, that's not material, because it doesn't add anything. What adds to, that, to, to your knowledge is if I tell you what I know about this man and why he's special and why he has to be looked after. He has to be looked after very, very carefully. Okay. And again, I say, I'm 40 years older, and I couldn't do that. However much people think I'm good, I'm not that good. And I'm 40 years older. OK. So um, if I, and I apologize, I'm going to be reading it, because otherwise it will it'll take a bit long. OK. So one of the scientists I very much admire said that the true measure of a scientist's contribution is not the medals and the citations, etc., that you accumulate. The legacy is the students they leave behind. So I can stop now because my legacy is intact. <laughs> so I think while all the students one teaches in one's career are important, there will always be a small select group who are just a little bit more special. And I went through the list of my students, and I had some incredibly, incredibly special students. But he's the most special. Okay, in, in 30 or 40 years of teaching, he's the most special. Because whatever they achieved, it's not as good as what he's already achieved and what he will achieve. Imagine him standing here in 40 years' time giving you a lecture. Imagine what it's going to be like. So I first met Habib when he was studying, as he described, I'm just going to go through a little bit of our background. You saw the pictures and so on, but I just want to give you my impressions. I first met Habib when he was studying for his honors and master's degrees. And during that time, we didn't have any special relationship. He was just another student in the class. And he was studying biokinetics, which wasn't really my interest. My interest is in exercise physiology. And then one day, he approached me and asked if I would be agreeable to supervise his PhD. And he indicated that he wished to study the cricket back lift, about which you now have heard that he is the world authority. And this is now five, six years later. So that's quite something. And it turns out that whatever he may say, that there are many factors determining success, the one factor is the back lift. That all, if you don't have this back lift, you ain't going to be successful. Doesn't matter what other attributes you've got. If you're not doing this, you're not going to be successful. So he's identified probably the key variable in cricket batting success. So neither of us knew very much about the back lift, and I certainly had no idea how he was going to tackle the question, because that's, as a scientist, okay, how are you going to study this question? What's the hypothesis? How are you going to study it? I had absolutely no clue. Because I'm a physiologist, I'm not a biomechanist. So, but I need not have worried because I can honestly say that everything you heard today began from that moment, and it was in his direction. I contributed essentially nothing. And I, I want to make that point. I might have been there, but the intellectual input was all his own. I was little more than an interested spectator offering sage comments every so often, like the sort of cricket observer in the, st in the stand saying, oh, I know why South Africa doesn't win test matches. <laughs> and that was my role. And I was just uh, as a spectator. And in the end, it all turned out for the best, for which I take no credit. Habib took the spark of an idea and turned it into an established fact, as he showed you on his last slide. I might add that he mentioned ageism and there was criticism of him. And there were some people who said, don't work with Habib. Why? Because he asked too many questions. <laughs> and I'll return to that point. So it's always too dangerous to challenge those who don't like uncertainty. And that, the whole final slide, was all about uncertainty. So. It was during this time that I began to learn exactly who is this person, Habib. I learned that he comes from a deeply loving, very tight-knit family, and that he has a strong faith, strong religious faith. And I think those are two crucial components. If you want to be a scientist, you need support, because you're going to get people who dislike you. 
And I know I always pay tribute to my wife for getting me through some tough times. I too, I too learned that his personal circumstances when he grew, grew up were quite different from mine. I mention only this because I was inaugurated as a professor at the age of 40 and he's at the age of 34. So he beat me by six years. But I had all the advantages, absolute advantages. I grew up as a white person in the apartheid era. And he didn't. And the nature of the privilege was that not once did I ever lack for anything. And I'm sure his, Habib did not lack for anything in terms of love and support. And I, neither did I. From his biography, and he spoke about it, I learned that to play cricket, he had to walk up to three hours a day on the days that he played cricket. And that I didn't know about. And that meant he required a bit more determination than I did. I got driven to the cricket field. I didn't have to walk to it. And I was still useless. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that has not deterred him. He became known as the Joburg cricketer who walks everywhere. Would I, would I have had the drive to walk as he did? I don't know. I wasn't put to that test. But he was put to the test and he passed it. From his work ethic and the innovative approach to every challenge during his PhD, I learned a lot more about Habib. You saw how many athletes he tested. He told you he did it in one month, which was astonishing. He came to me one day and he said, I'm going to go and study all the cricketers in South Africa. Not for one moment did I think he could do it in a month. Because you think he's talking to professional cricketers who have limited time. He has to organize the filming. He's got to go to the town, find these athletes, and film them. He does all of South Africa in a couple of weeks, and then where does he go to? He goes to England and does the same thing. Now you think, and how young is he then? Now he's 29. Who has got the, the courage to do that? I just, it's just unbelievable. So and often he would tell me the full details of what he had done only after he'd already up, written up the study for publication and presented it to me for some help with editing. He was the complete, he did it all by himself, as I've shown. And during this period, his pro capacity for producing work was frankly unmatched by any other student I've ever taught. And you can see that. I mean, the, the range of his intellect is astonishing. All those topics. How does he, how is he able to understand all of them? So I continue to be amazed at the breadth of his academic topics on which he's interested and his ability and desire to interest others, including the general public, in those ideas. So I also learned of his ability to be brutally honest with himself, and he spoke about that. Early on, when he started writing articles, I think I frustrated him enormously, because I would take his written document and I'd red pen it. I'd put a red pen through it. And I think after one particularly rigorous round of corrections, he came and asked for a week off. So I said, why do you need a week off? Where are you going? What are you going to do in this week? He said, no, no, I've read about there's a course, I think at the University of Natal, on scientific writing. And he literally booked himself in, flew to Durban, did the week's course, and that was the end of the problem. And I could throw the pen away after that. I threw the red pen away, because why? Because he's such a quick learner, and never again did I have to critique his writing skills again. And so he, become, he, he had learned the necessary lessons, and I was becoming increasingly superfluous to his writing, because now he could do it all by himself. So he's brutally honest with himself because, and this is important, he's not burdened down by ego. Ego is the real killer. And he was prepared to say, you don't have to tell me that I'm not writing well. I understand. You got, I got the message. I will solve the problem. I'm not ego-driven that I'm going to get angry with you and scratch out at you and scream at you. I will do the job. So he's also absolutely fearless. And I think that, that message came through. He's not scared to do anything. But the best example was while he was working on his thesis and traveling widely to collect the data, he told me, I want to go to Chennai, India. So I said, why do you want to go to Chennai, India? No, because A.B. de Villiers and Chris Gale play for them, and they're the two best batsmen in the world. And there's a great laboratory in Chennai. They both played for the Chennai Super Kings at that time. 
and he wanted to do some of those biomechanics studies that you saw, they could do them in Chennai. So I said, well, okay, now <laughs> this one's not going to come off because I can't see it. And in the end, unfortunately, Messrs. de Villiers and Gale were simply too busy to accommodate him. But which South African sees the future and says, that's what I want to study, and I'm prepared to go and find it and get them to work with me, even though they're two of the best cricketers in the world. So the point is, he's fearless in trying to get it to happen. And who else would have dared to do that? And then, of course, he hasn't referred to his period of becoming Mr. South Africa. But predictably, even though he was not a male model, he won it. And the, being a male model is often an important criterion for success. But only he, he won it, but only after telling the organizers that the rules of the competition had to change if he was to continue participating. <laughs> you know, he changed the rule. And from this, I learned that he has strong personal convictions and accepts no compromises. Doesn't accept compromise. He could have said, OK, I'm not in this competition unless you allow me to do x, y, and z. But he didn't. During that time that he was writing his PhD and becoming Mr. South Africa, he also wrote his autobiography, which beat me by 20 years. Because <laughs> I read mine at 60, sorry, by 25, because I finished mine at 60 and he'd done his at, at 30. Then in the years that he realized I needed his support, this is where the family comes in. When I had my own issues, he was one of the very few who was concerned enough for myself and my wife that he would come to my legal court hearings on several days. And he kept in other, in other ways. And there was a handful of people who supported me. And he was, he was one of the strongest supporters. And that told me something about him, his family and what they taught him and the good that they had imparted on him. And always he expressed intense and real caring. This must be part of what he inherited from his very caring family and the caring, loving env environment in which he's been raised, that you, can, that you can read in the person. Which brings me now to my concluding points, and I think that these are some of the most important points but that he was making. To explain why the University of Johannesburg, of Johannesburg has been so clever in appointing Habib as a full professor, and why it needs to ensure that his personal approach is allowed to flourish. So I've made that point. This man's special. Got to look after him. So you see, in the end, the search for knowledge and truth occurs in a supportive, caring, loving environment. It's exactly what he said. And I hadn't seen his lecture. And that's the type of environment that Habib expresses daily through his interactions with his family and with everyone else. In the end, the teams that produce the best research in science are no different from the teams that produce them are most successful on the sporting fields. It's, it's absolutely the same phenomenon. And he was referring, reflecting on it in part. Many might think that success in team sports is simply a matter of having perhaps purchasing the most talent for one's yeah, team. Nothing could be less true. Sports teams rise or fall on the character and ethos of the team. That's it. The ethos of the team determines their success, which is much more important than the physical abilities of the players. Sports teams rise or fall on the character and ethos of the team. There is a special environment that cre creates the ethos that produce, produces exceptional excellence, something we call perfect, perfection. And Habib understands that ethos, and he has the personality and the character pr to produce it here at UJ. And that his whole lecture showed that. What, what evidence have I to make such a bold prediction? For inspiration and confirmation, I brought along two books with me, and I'm not sure where to put them. <laughs> but I know Habib is a great reader, and he will appreciate the sections to which I refer. The first one I, I haven't got here, well, it's by Walter Cannon, who was a professor of physiology at Harvard University for 40 years after the beginning of World War II. His book, entitled The Way of the Investigator, describes what he believes to be the key characteristics of a successful scientist. And he wrote this in the 1920s, but it's as valid today. He includes the characteristics to which I've already referred. He qu I quote, 
It is hardly necessary to mention a humble attitude as a qualification for a man of science. And this man is humble, absolutely humble. And that's why people perhaps don't understand just how good he is. Even though it may not be an essential qualification, it is a desirable one. And he then explains why that is. How little we know of the immensity and structure of the universe and of the nature of the earth and all who dwell therein. How meager during the days of our lives can the scientists make a contribution towards the solution of these endless mysteries? They are too big for us to answer. The only reasonable attitude of the seeker after truth is that of true humility. And that's what we heard tonight. He has humility in buckets. Cannon continues, and I invite you to, to see what factors he says are important and see whether you think they came through in the lecture tonight. The first one is curiosity. Well, he scored 100% on curiosity, as you could hear. Second, imaginative insight. He scores pretty close to 100 on that as well. Critical judgment. Absolutely. When he unpacked all the stories and the problems he was defining, critical judgment, absolutely perfect. Thorough honesty. That's one thing this man is absolutely honest. He t when he says something that comes out of his mouth, you know it is the absolute truth. In as much as truth is truth, but it's a truth as we understand it. A retentive memory is astonishing. I mean, the topics that he covered today means he's read an enormous amount of material and he's retained that information. Patience, we well, have to have patience. <laughs> with, with, if you're as clever as him, you have to have patience with people who are less clever than you. And you must never show that you consider yourself to be more clever. And that's, he never shows that, never absolutely shows that, because it comes to his humility. Good health, well, I helped him on that one, changed his diet. <laughs> and then generosity, well, you can see the generosity of spirit because he mentioned everyone who's impacted on his life at, at, at every possibility. And he, Cannon couldn't list all of which of those factors was more important, but it doesn't matter because we've got the full package here, full 100% package here. So the greatest challenge Habib faces is the one that all young, young scientists face. It is to raise the funding necessary to do the research that is radical enough to push back the boundaries. Notice the radical enough because that's what we need to focus on. But there's very little financial support that does not come with what we shall politely call conditions. And that is the problem because conditions can turn the scientific enterprise into a vehicle for propagating propaganda. Okay, and that, I know I'm going a little bit deep without saying it. I don't want to say it. I'm going to leave you to fill in the gaps. So we live in a, today in a very, very complex global environment that reminds me of what my late parents must have faced in the 1939 and when they, in their teens and early 20s, they were faced with the imminent prospects and consequences of World War II. I'm not suggesting we're facing World War II or World War III. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting something different. We now live in a world in which there is a hidden war and it's being waged against the expression of free, free thought, especially in academic space at the universities. There is a threat to free thought at universities. And as someone who suffered from it and went to court for four years to claim back my free speech, I feel very strongly about it. But real science can only exist and flourish in an environment in which doubt is encouraged. You have to promote doubt, as, as we heard. And freedom of thought are cherished. Yet that is what is being curtailed on a daily basis by those who talk about settled science. There's no such thing as settled science. And classically, by those scientific dictators who like to claim, I am the science. And you know who I'm referring to. No, sir, you're not, you are not the science. So we come to the second book of the evening, written by one of the true geniuses of the 20th century, Nobel laureate Richard Feynman. 
And this is the book that, that definitely is going to appeal to Habib because he will understand it, because he has the same mental approach as Richard Feynman. So what he says was, cre science creates a power through its knowledge, a power to do things. It does not give instructions of how to use it for good rather than evil. And now we come to the point. Scientists' statements are approximate. They're never absolutely certain. They're never absolutely certain. We must, learn, we must leave room for doubt, or there is no progress and there's no learning. Once you know it all, there's no progress. There is no learning without having to pose a question, and a question requires doubt. I don't know the answer, that's why I praise the question. Before you begin an experiment, you must not know the answer. And that's where science has been corrupted. Because if you know the answer, then it's like match fixing in cricket. Yeah. And, and so much of science globally, where it's funded by industry, is just that. It's match fixing. If you already know the answer, there's no need to gather any evidence. And to judge the evidence, you must take all of it, not just the parts you like. That's terribly important. And I, I know that I told told taught Habib that the most important piece of information or evidence is the piece that disagrees with you. That's the one. All the stuff that agrees with you, that's window dressing. It's the one study that disagrees with you. That's the one you have to look at. That's a responsibility that science fell towards each other, a kind of morality. Sorry, that scientists tell towards each other, a kind of morality, that when you do science, you don't know the answer. That's the morality of science and we're losing that morality. So, just a little bit more. Science has had long experience with ignorance, doubt, and uncertainty. Our freedom to doubt was born of a struggle against authority, a very deep and powerful struggle. Permit us to question, to doubt, and to not be sure. That's all we ask. We have to be protected to be able to question and doubt. We must not forget the importance of the struggle or we may lose what we have gained. Here lies the responsibility to society, to, to society to pass on what we have learned and to leave future scientists a free hand. We make a grave error if we say we have the answers now, suppressing all discussion and criticism. We thus doom mankind to be chained to authority, to the limits of our present understanding, as has been done so often before. And he finishes up, science produces ignorance, and ignorance fuels science. Yeah. So I want to thank you for fueling our ignorance and for fueling science. It's been a fabulous evening. It's been a wonderful lecture. Again, I want to emphasize, we were all blessed tonight. We were really blessed. So thank you for that. Right, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Tumane, Professor Habib, Professor Craig, uh, and as well as the respondent, we will now be gowning Professor Habib. Normally this is done by the Dean, but she's asked me to, pick, to go to New Heights. <laughs> <laughs> I've had the same challenges with, with uh, people like Professor Craig this year, so. Congratulations, let's give <laughs> Professor <laughs> Yes, 
I think that we should give Professor Habib Nurbai another round of applause. Uh, congratulations. I think uh, this was an excellent presentation. The way that you took the journey through your own uh, upbringing from a sports perspective, the experience that you had, and how it all came together. Uh, I have seen your role in, also in the teaching and learning side. Uh, I must say on, the lighter, on a lighter note that about sometime during COVID-19, uh, Professor Habib was helping to prepare a number of videos on how you should, be, uh, you should keep fit during this, uh, this time. And I was having this conversation with him, and he was talking about role models. And the job there was to do some push-ups. And I very quickly realized that if I continued along those discussions, he would, be, he would have me in an online video uh, doing exactly that. So he is extremely convincing uh, from that perspective. And of course, he has uh, done quite a bit of influence, the role of gamification and how it impacts the way that uh, learning and teaching is progressed, the integration of artificial intelligence into sports, which is, of course, a very growing and a fast uh, growing uh, uh, field. Um, and, uh, and also, I think that the university's uh, strategic direction, which at the moment is looking at the fourth industrial revolution, or if you like, artificial intelligence, and how does it orient towards societal impact, I think in this presentation, one really sees a trajectory towards that direction. And it is something that we know that you take conscious uh, interest in, and you have really helped to align a lot of the work that has been happening in your own discipline to that uh, strategic endeavor. I also want to thank Professor Tim Noakes for your contribution and for your very nice elucidation of Habib. You've known Habib for quite some time. Uh, and the sketch in which you have indeed uh, you know, absolutely, it is the case that Habib is special to us, uh, and uh, that I, I don't, I wanted to say a game changer, but you know, in this, uh, in this discipline, it does take a different feel, a different uh, meaning. Uh, you can see I'm struggling with my sporting words, um, but of course, uh, that is something that we really appreciate. You've been an A-rated researcher for multiple years. Uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, we do take your uh, sentiment, your statements quite seriously, and we appreciate it. Do you again want to echo uh, the support from the family? And I think that both to Professor Noakes and the family, we should give another round of applause. I, I do want to acknowledge that there are many instances where Habib has had challenges uh, because there are work obligations, especially during COVID-19, and there are family commitments. Uh, and Habib, you've really, you know, gone, you know, really helped us uh, in terms of being able to bring about that work-life balance, and also being an example yourself uh, in terms of what it entails, the aspect around mental well-being. So, so thanks again, and thanks to the family and to the sister that's here. And also to the students uh, that's been here, the collaborators, as Professor Nirvai has indicated, uh, is absolutely the case that our students become alum very quickly, integrate with the ecosystem that the university provides. Um, and to, uh, to all the other colleagues that have joined, to the dean, to the vice dean, for the support that you provide within the faculty that has really made this happening. And behind this, uh, the organizers the, of this event, uh, the events coordination team, our photographer, our videographer, that has enabled the online uh, component. Now, I do know that some of you are fasting, and you have now these considered thoughts uh, about nutrition, especially with a person like Professor Tim Noakes being here. Uh, but if you do need any advice, aside from the food, we will be all together adjacent 
uh, where you some, in some cases some of you may have the chance also I suppose to break your day's fast. Uh, so thank you uh, once again and we're just joining adjacent. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.